see a few more coming in. Okay, it's 10.02, so we will start. Um, so, <clears throat> hi everyone, um, welcome to the quarterly BGC Argo webinar series. Um, this is hosted by uh, the Go BGC program and the U.S. Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry uh, program. Uh, thank you, May and Heather, for you know always organizing and helping us um, promote this work. And then this webinar from the um, from our side, uh, the organizing committee is uh, myself, John Sharp, Yibin Huang, and Channing Prend, and Lin Tally. Um, I think they're online. Um, but yeah, this definitely takes a village to uh, organize and make happen. So um, thank you, everyone, for your. Um, and contributions. So, uh, you know, so we always start this webinar off with a, you know, quick summary of, of BGC Argo and Go BGC. So um, there you go. Yeah. So BGC Argo is, it is part of the One Argo program. The target is 4,700 floats, uh, you know, of which 2,500 would be core floats and shown in red, 1,200 in deep, uh, deep floats shown in blue, and 1,000 BGC floats shown in green here with increased density in these um, key regions of the ocean. And so how we got to the 1,000, you know, float target um, size is explained in this biogeochemical Argo science and implementation plan. Uh, it's a really you know, detailed and thorough document. I highly recommend uh, if you're interested in, you know, system design, um, please take a read. Um, very informative. Uh, and then I want to stress that the data from Argo and BGC Argo are QC'd and freely available. You know, the main access point uh, is through the Argo uh, GDAC, the Global Data Assembly Center. And if you access and uh, if you access the data through this uh, through the GDAC, please use the SPROF, which is the synthetic profile, where the pressure axis has been merged for the core and BGC um, uh, parameters. So it just makes it a lot more user friendly. And there are tools like the One Argo Toolbox that you will hear about today uh, that makes access um, uh, straightforward. And then, uh, in addition to that, for the SOCOM and GoBGC program, um, there are data snapshots that uh, it's not quarterly, but three uh, three times a year, where we um, do a delayed mode QC and archive the data. Um, and then these archives include derived carbon parameters, so PCO2, DIC, alkalinity, and POC, so the particular organic carbon estimated from uh, backscatters. So there's a little bit you know, of additional um, information there, but they only include um, floats from these two programs. <clears throat> so, um, so the target BGC Argo array looks something like this. You know, if we this is just randomly uh, located thousand float array. So if we reach the full array size, this is kind of where what we would end up. You know, this is what we would look like. And then currently, the current status of BGC Argo looks something like this. And then so there are five hundred thirty three operational floats globally, of which three hundred thirty five have uh, four plus sensors, and that's thirty more from our um, since the February webinar, which is exciting. And forty two floats now have all six parameters, which is also very exciting. And then so, uh, so that array is uh, growing, and so the uh, the GoBGC program is an NSF funded. Uh, a mid-scale research infrastructure proposal uh, to deploy 500 uh, BGC floats with five or six parameters uh, globally. And then so we are in year two of, or year three of the program. And so far we have deployed 114 uh, GoBGC floats and the, here are the locations uh, for these 114 floats. And since February, we have deployed 22 more. Uh, and the general regions where these floats have been deployed are shown in the white boxes. Uh, so these are, you know, these are floats that have been, been deployed in the past couple of months. And so if you're interested in these regions of the ocean, you know, please go take a look at the data. And then to kind of give you an idea where uh, future deployments are coming uh, over the next six months, uh, the colored filled dots are locations for floats that we have, you know, um, dedicated, uh, we have identified a cruise and these uh, floats have been built and some of them have been shipped. So you can see that the Indian Ocean uh, will start to get filled in through the I-5 line here and another uh, cruise here, the North Pacific, and then also kind of along here on the uh, Eastern uh, Pacific as well. So, you know, uh, we have, you know, 68 uh, float deployments planned over the next six months, and we will continue to uh, deploy uh, more floats. In addition to uh, GoBGC and SOCOM, there are, you know, over the next five years, about 250 floats uh, that have been 
uh, planned or committed from uh, international partners. And so the general regions where these floats will go in is shown in these yellow um, uh, squares, but the exact locations have not been determined yet. So, but these are kind of the, you know, growing regions of interest, I think, uh, for uh, the, in the global BGC Argo. Okay, so I wanted to, you know, and I was provided an update for our program in BGC Argo. So now there are uh, monthly SPROF archives with a DOI. So this, uh, the, um, you know, so this, if you go to this link in this QR code, there are monthly archives for the, and all of the Argo data here, you know, so this is from June. And then there's also uh, just a subset of the BGC SPROF um, archives. That's just a smaller data, um, data set, but this, the data are provided in the same data format as the GDAC, and then so it's kind of frozen in time. And then so if you want to use it for publications, this would be a good place to access the data so that you know that your data, you know, you can use the data with an assigned DOI to go back and reanalyze the data if uh, need be, because the Argo GDAC is, you know, constantly evolving and changing, you know, data set as QC procedures are um, improved. Another update, there are now four dual channel chlorophyll flowmeters. Um, uh, floats deployed. Uh, so these are, uh, this is a new sensor developed by Seabird, uh, where uh, the chlorophyll fluorescence is excited at both 435 and 470 nanometers. And so the idea is that 435 uh, is a more direct uh, excitation for the chlorophyll A pigment, and 470 is more for the auxiliary pigments. So um, the hope is that there is, you know, that will be, the lead to a better um, proxy for chlorophyll uh, concentration. So this is a profile uh, of the chlorophyll from the two channels in Hawaii that we uh, deployed last month. So you can see there is a little bit of a difference here, you know, so, you know, so um, hopefully that there's some additional information that we can extract from that. Additionally, there was a working group for the downwelling irradiance channels. And then, so now BGC Argo has kind of standardized downwelling irradiance channels. So we, uh, the working group made a recommendation that uh, the downwelling radiometer should have 380, 443, 490, and 555 uh, nanometers at their four channels. And then the PAR, it was shown that PAR can be modeled very accurately by these four wavelengths. So that's the, um, uh, the uh, citation here. And that's, we no longer recommend having a PAR channel, but we will calculate from the other channels. Uh, and following this, the GOBGC floats, uh, the APEX floats next year will be equipped with, with, some of them will be equipped with radiometers, so we'll have a growing number of radiometer floats uh, in the coming years. And finally, this is a um, side, this is another update. So uh, there is a growing interest to look for alternative um, P8 sensors, and then so we uh, we're explore, we are exploring the pyroscience pH optode. And then so uh, we, this is a profile for using um, underwater gliders. And then so the standard foils that come with this um, uh, with this sensor. So this is descending and this is ascending, uh, blue and black. And then the difference is shown in the um, black. And as you can see, there's the sensor response time is slow. So that, it leads, that will lead to a large um, hysteresis. Uh, so we are working with um, Pyroscience to test a faster response foil, and hopefully we will have uh, uh, several floats with this faster foil deployed in the next couple of months. So hopefully in the next webinar, we can provide you with data from this updated uh, foil. But um, just, you know, we, I've gotten some requests and questions from many people, so I just wanted to um, show some results of what we have done in our lab. Okay, so... You know, so I want to, so before I pass it on to the speakers, I just wanted to remind everyone that data are QC'd and freely available. And then there are, you know, toolboxes and tools to look, to access and visualize the data, which is what we're going to hear about today. And then, so the first speaker is Reiner Schlitzer. And so he is, uh, he led the development for the Ocean Data View, um, which is a desktop app that's been, you know, highly used in the oceanographic community. It's an extremely powerful um, program that can, you know, visualize and, you know, analyze a variety of different data sets. And then recently, you know, Reiner's team has made that into a web app, a web application that where uh, a lot of data sets are preloaded, including the BGC Argo uh, data set. So he will talk um, about the functionalities and, um, you know, and I really think that web ODV and ODV is just such a powerful tool to, you know, visualize data and explore, you know, explore, you know, the Argo and other data sets. So, you know, I'm excited to hear more about it. And then Hartmut uh, Frenzel, he's a research scientist at the uh, 
uh, Noah PMEL, and he uh, led the development with John Sharp for the One Argo uh, toolbox. And so he'll be telling us about uh, the, you know, the new uh, functionalities that has been added recently that will um, that makes accessing BGC Argo data uh, very straightforward. So I'm um, really excited to hear um, the talks. So I will pass it on to Reiner. Okay, you uh, thanks very much for the kind introduction and also for inviting me uh, to this webinar. Thanks also to everyone joining the webinar. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, basically, can you see it? Is it large? Yep, the size is pretty good. Okay, so um, in this next 20 minutes, um, I want to report on, on a new aggregated BGC Argo dataset and how it can be used online um, using this uh, relatively new web ODV uh, online service. This is work that I have been doing together with uh, Sebastian Miro Schnölle at the Alfred uh, Wegener Institute. And um, just a few words on, on the data set. Um, this is the current name. Um, it has been aggregated um, using all the BGC Argo synthetic profile NetCDF files as of end of May, uh, resulting in um, the quite large number of two, more than 280,000 uh, biogeochemical um, profiles. Um, the data set includes all the parameters that were found in these NetCDF files. So in addition to classical hydrography, um, all these uh, biogeochemical parameters, which is quite a number, as you can see. And some of them um, I, I will show today. Um, this is the, the global coverage, pretty good covering um, the entire ocean. There are gaps, but as Yui has um, already shown, um, floats are added constantly. So eventually all these gaps will be filled. Um, in terms of temporal coverage, basically um, the core of this um, data set covers the last 10 years. There are some earlier data, but all the results that will be displayed in the um, images basically reflect the last decade. Um, and now I, before doing a live demo, which should cover most of the time, I, I want to show just a few uh, example use cases. Um, the settings to generate these views, which I call a view in, in ODV or web ODV, they come with the data set and they can be loaded pretty quickly by loading a view with the given name. So in this case, we are just looking at a single float in the Eastern Mediterranean. And, and in, in this image, we are looking at chlorophyll A signal uh, in the upper ocean over the entire lifetime of the float. So pretty interesting science. Uh, which will not be the topic of today. But just to give you an, an, a first indication of what can be done. Second example, uh, looking at the map of uh, oxygen distribution, in this case, uh, 500 decibars. Uh, going further, looking at oxygen uh, shallower, 250 decibars in the Southern Ocean. Uh, looking here at uh, nitrate, same uh, level, 250 decibar Southern Ocean. Uh, here, focusing on um, the Irminger and Labrador Sea um, and looking at nitrate on the y-axis uh, of uh, floats versus uh, season in the upper graph with two particular floats uh, uh, highlighted, and here looking at nitrate versus time, linear time. And uh, just two more quickly, um, oxygen 250 decibars plotted in interrupted uh, map to minimize um, um, distortion. Uh, oxygen saturation as one example of a derived quantity, calculated quantity on the basis of the measured 
ones. And finally, here an example of uh, AOU, apparent oxygen utilization at 250 decibels um, worldwide. Uh, so all these results, which include uh, impressive science, they come from this, um, well, aggregated coverage of the biogeochemical Argo floats. Very impressive. Um, I, I want to go on with uh, a live demo. <clears throat> Um, all these data are now um, available at this website, and I'm posting all these links uh, into the chat, if I can. Right now, I don't see the chat. Oh, I do see. So that um, after the webinar, um, you, you can try um, yourself so the first link uh, will get you to the server. Then there are um, help documents that um, tell you how to log into that server. And if you have never worked with ODV or ODV online, then uh, some other documents will uh, help you getting started. So once you choose this um, first link, getting to the EGIA. So if you are wondering what EGI stands for, um, that's a European uh, initiative, EGIA is a EU-funded project, and uh, Sebastian and myself, we are doing it in the context of this uh, program, and it's actually running on hardware provided by EGI. Um, so once you have succeeded logging in, then uh, you will be presented with uh, this screen at the bottom, um, there's a tree view showing uh, the available data set. So in addition to biogeochemical Argo, there are also all the uh, TS Argo data available. There are also data available from the Sea Data Net project uh, in Europe. Um, we will, I will leave these um, untouched today, and we will focus on the BGC Argo Global Profiles uh, data set that I've introduced just a minute ago. So you start by, by clicking on this link. Um, you will have a choice of two services. And today I will solely focus on data exploration. Data extraction gives you a simple step-by-step uh, -step, um, um, functionality to uh, extract subsets of the data, but you will see uh, that uh, in the exploration service, you can also get subsets of the data. So you click on it, and within your web browser, you will be presented with an interface that um, looks like uh, an ODV um, standalone application window. So if you have worked with ODV before, the ODV online, as I'm calling this interface, will look very familiar. It doesn't only look like, but it also functions like. So left clicking on a given uh, point here in the map, choose this current station. The metadata of that station will be uh, shown in this upper list. And there are detailed um, uh, metadata um, including a uh, type of float, serial numbers of floats, but also the originator, the PI, and the institutions behind it. Um, I consider all this Im information important. Uh, I just heard about the DOI, so maybe in the future I, I should find out how to also extract the DOI and provide the DOI. Um, in, in the middle list here, that will show the data of all these parameters that I have listed before. So that's this long list for one of the samples of this station, of this station marked here in the map, um, and color indicating uh, quality issue. Um, so left-clicking uh, select something, right-clicking will give menu. So I've right-clicked on the map, that will give you the menu of all the functionality um, operating on the map. And we will do some of these. Um, Right-clicking on, on other areas like the background, the canvas give you different um, menus. And similarly, you can also right-click into these windows here and you get options. So all this works just like in ODV. 
There's also a main uh, menu bar here, and we will um, visit some, the view. Uh, and later, hopefully, I have time to, to also uh, do uh, some export. Um, so maybe this is enough for a quick introduction. Um, so let's start with actually doing something. And the first thing we want to do is, um, how do we get additional parameters that we derive from the measured parameters? So go to view derived variables that will give you a long list of choices here, different categories, and we will uh, try some. So we will um, take day of the year uh, derived from the station date. So you just click on it and it will be um, uh, it will become available. We will also look at uh, a linear time, uh, also based on the station metadata date and time. And um, we will now look at uh, oxygen saturation. We also would like to have AOU. And just as something more exotic that maybe not many of you um, know about, if if we want to calculate something using an expression that you might have found in the literature, then you would go into this group, uh, click expression. And the example I want to do is POC, POC estimated in micro millimole uh, per kilogram, I think. Uh, which uh, Ken Johnson has uh, correlated on the basis of particle backscattering data. So I will use particle backscattering as input. This will be referred in the formula by this hash one. And I um, will enter the equation in a traditional form. I, I will copy paste it in and say a few words. Oops. Sorry. So this formula of Ken Johnson that would take uh, particle backscattering, multiply by this, by this factor, add 3.04, divide uh, by 12 to convert from milligram carbon to millimole carbon. Uh, that, this is the formula. And I will convert it to postfix notation, which ODV can deal with. Um, that's all that you have to do. You click apply, and then this parameter is also added. And the formula will be evaluated whenever POC is needed. So this is enough for uh, the derived parameters that we will use. Um, these derived variables, they are added to the list of parameters. So uh, all these will become available for plotting. And I think I, I have to move very fast. Um, we we now want to, uh, to zoom into a, certain region. And so uh, let me also show a one, one example of uh, station filtering. And uh, a case when I want to be very specific in, in the area from which the stations are supposed to come. So this option would allow me to define a polygon. And if I apply this filter, then only these particular stations will, will make it. And um, I will, so we will do just one example. And um, we will now create, um, in addition to the map, uh, a window for which we want to define uh, the properties. So now I right click on this window, uh, go to uh, properties. I 
on the x-axis, I would like to have uh, day of the year. On the y-axis, I would like to have oxygen saturation. Nothing on, on the z-axis, and I uh, press apply. I, I also want to define a, a sample filter for this window. And I click on range here. I want to confine the pressure to uh, just between zero and 20 decibels. So I'm only interested in, in surface values. And finally, I will now go again to properties and choose scatter, which uh, will show all the data of all the stations shown here in the map, but filtered according to the sample filter that I have applied. So in this case, just samples between 0 and 20 decibels. And once we do it, then um, we get a plot like this. We see that there are floats that, uh, oh, I, I can actually remove these and, and also um, set a filter on, on quality and, and just allow uh, good data, apply this to all variables. And then some of these uh, bad looking uh, data are gone. There are still uh, um, float data that look um, not so terribly good. Uh, I can do some polishing by, by zooming into this region. And um, if this is what I'm looking for, uh, oxygen saturation behavior uh, versus season, then this would be my, my result. If I have something interesting, then um, you should save this setup, which sometimes can take minutes or, or half an hour. You can save it under a certain name, like oxy saturation and blah, blah, blah. And usually you should give a good name uh, because um, later you want to find um, views by the name. Um, once I've done it, then um, this view that I've just defined, this will become part of my private views um, that I can load. Uh, the public ones, the ones that I have prepared with the data set, they, uh, they are available all the time. Okay, maybe this is um, all concerning making plots, but finally, let me also show you how, how you get uh, images so that you can put them in your uh, manuscript. Uh, so you go to the window, or if you want to have uh, an image of the entire uh, page, then you go over the canvas. If I just want to have an image of, of this window, right click, save plot as, I have some options concerning uh, image format, resolution, some style options. Uh, you click apply, and this is a matter of seconds. And, and now this plot is on my machine here. Uh, just to finish off, um, the export uh, option that allows you to, to export this set of stations, the subset of stations that I have filtered out into uh, uh, different formats, or if you like this window and you just want to have XY data, then uh, you can also export uh, these data, um, choose some style of uh, and the format of, of um, the export, start the export, and again, it's, it's on my machine. So I, I think my time is over and I want to stop here. All this is just to, to make you curious and um, just highlight how much of interactivity you can get uh, without even downloading the data or uh, installing software. 
If you have used ODV before, then it should be super easy to uh, use this interface uh, on the web. And this is basically where I want to stop. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Reiner. Um, we will, uh, I just wanna, if people have questions, please put it into the chat and we'll come back to it at the end of uh, the webinar. So yeah, thank you for that wonderful demo, uh, Reiner. Um, and I really encourage people to just explore, you know, just go look at the data, it's really powerful. So um, Harmit, you are up and um, yeah, screen, we will start when the screen loads. Can you see it? Still loading. Yeah, it's still loading on our end, I think. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, hello, and thank you, Yui, for the invitation and the introduction. I will talk about the OneAlgo toolbox. With the MATLAB version of it was originally developed by John Sharp and continued by him and me together. The R version is maintained by Marin Konek and Ivan Wang, and Andrea Fassbender leads the BGC Argo group at NOAA PMEL in Seattle. So as you mentioned, all Argo data are freely available to the public in near real-time mode and with some delay in QC mode. All you need to do is go to the website of the GDAC, click your way through the directory structure, which has a very clear organization, and download the files. All you need to know are the WDO and IDs of the floats you're interested in and the data assembly center that handles its data. This works fine for if you just have a few floats, but if you dislike clicking like me, you would probably still write a script to do this tedious task. But in most cases, you don't know the WOM or IDs that you're interested in. You have questions like, what are all the pH profiles in the Southern Ocean that have been in delayed mode quality control? And maybe for a particular time period, any of these uh, criteria in your search. And for that, it's not very easy to go to the GDAC because you would have to know all these. So that is the idea of the toolbox, to provide you with an abstraction layer and to shield all those details off the website and make it easy for you to define your criteria and get the data without going to the website itself. And as you mentioned, uh, we use the SPROF files, which contain all the profiles in one NetCDF file on a synthetic pressure axis for the BGC floats and for the core and deep floats, the profile files, prof files. So back to the GDAC structure, we use, so this is for a core float. This is the float that, and this is a type of file we download. We don't use the individual profile files at all. There are functions to download the three other types, the, the, the trash, the meta, and the tech file, but that's all it does. If, if you need these files, if there's information in there that you can use for your analysis, you can download them, but you will have to write your own code to use the data from them. Quick overview of the history of this toolbox. We started this effort two years ago for the first GoBGZ workshop. We made a few updates to the BGC Argo version, which was the initial version. And then last year we expanded it to full Argo or one Argo and changed the name. There were a few updates since then and bug fixes. And before the next GoBGC science workshop in August, we will label this as version 1.1. So how do you work with the toolbox? On the left is the workflow. It's four steps. First, you define your search criteria. There are 10 different search criteria shown on the right, and it's any combination of the geographic area, the time period, the ocean basin, the sensor or variable, the data mode, the maximum profile depth, the float type, the data assembly center that is handling the float, 
If you already know the float IDs, then you can specify those and add additional criteria. For instance, if you look at your own floats and you want to see just the data from last month, so only those that have been delay mode quality controlled, you can add those and then you get only those profiles for these floats. And finally, the minimum number of profiles for a given float that match all the other criteria. And you can do any combination of these, can define all of them, none of them, so that is your first step. And when the toolbox finds the floats that match these criteria, it will automatically download the SPROF and PROF files, and you can start exploring data and make some plots. If you're not quite done with this, if you like to have, maybe you want to expand the geographical area because you didn't find quite enough floats, you can modify the criteria. And once you're done, you can load the data into memory and then perform your data analysis with functions that you write yourself. Now, as I just showed, we had 10 options for the select profiles functions. We do not expect you to memorize the format of all these or names of all these options. So each function is documented in standard MATLAB fashion. You just say help and the function name, and then you get a full description of all the options. And this is only the first page here. There would be several more pages of this help page for this particular function. So going more into detail for this first step, the general call is you have to select profiles and then you have to specify the longitude and latitude limits, which can be either rectangle or a polygon and the start date and the end date, and then six more optional criteria. And in return, you get the float IDs and the float profile indices. The most extreme case of using this function is to leave all the four mandatory arguments empty. That gives you all the floats and all the float profiles. I tried that last Friday and it was almost 18,000 floats. So that's all active and inactive floats, over 2.8 million profiles. It took about two hours and it needs about 56 gigabytes of local storage. In most cases, you want to, of course, be a bit more specific with your criteria. So here's an example where I select profiles in the North Atlantic given by the latitude since the beginning of this year. And I specify the Atlantic and then I want to have all profiles, all floats that have a nitrate sensor on it that found 60 floats and over 1,000 profiles. The example that I will use most in this talk is oxygen profiles in delayed mode in the Eastern Pacific since 2018. So here I specify a rectangle of longitude and latitude limits. And I also specify the Pacific Ocean because the rectangle would include the Caribbean and parts of the Atlantic, plus the start date, Doxy is the oxygen sensor and delayed mode. That found 96 profiles over 96 floats over 8,000 profiles. And I'd like to point out that all this is just to demonstrate the capabilities of the toolbox. There is no scientific conclusion at the end. Once you have selected your profile, you can start with a data exploration. The first plot you probably want to make in every case is show where are the floats, which profiles do we have? This is shown on the left here where each float is colored in a different color. So MATLAB only has seven default colors, but you can see since they're not adjacent that these are the 96 floats that we found. You have some options for these trajectory plots. One of them is to show them by the data mode, which I show on the right. And since I specified that all profiles should be in delayed mode, I get a nice sanity check, all profiles are in delayed mode. If you hadn't done that, we would show other colors for real time and adjusted mode. Another visualization you can make is a time series plot. So in this case, I picked 10 profile, 10 floats of the 96 that had a chlorophyll sensor. You can see in the bottom right where they are. And here's a time series of chlorophyll near surface. You can also see from this plot when a particular float was active or at least when the particular sensor was still operable. 
And for the time series, you have multiple options. You can show one float, or as I do here, multiple floats. You can show one variable at a time or two variables at a time. And you can specify multiple depths, but each depth will be shown in one plot. Another visualization option is a vertical section plot. And this will always be one float and one variable per time. You can specify multiple floats and multiple variables. Then you will just get more plots. So here I picked a float that has a pH sensor. On the right is the trajectory, somewhere in the South Pacific. And you can see from the section plot that there was a time when the delayed mode operator decided that these data cannot be recovered and were flagged as bad. And on the left, in the early part, you see some weird part where it's all smooth. If you look at the trajectory, there were, it is very close to the 150 west boundary that I specified in my geographic limits. And for five months or so, the float was to the west of it. So this is something that you would do in your data exploration phase. Normally, if you see this, you would either change the geographic limits or maybe remove the first plot so that you don't have this kind of feature here. And one more standard plot you can make is a profile plot. You can do this for one float or multiple floats and for one or two variables per plot. Here I show the temperature profiles for all our 96 demo floats. The black line is the mean and the gray lines are actually all the individual over 8,000 profiles and they all just come together as one big area. And there's an option to show just the mean and standard deviation. This is here for the same temperature profiles. And here's an example of two variables at a time. So oxygen in black, temperature in blue. This is a float near the coast of Central America that explores the OMZ, which you see nicely in the profile plot. So these are the standard plots you can make with just one line of MATLAB. The, two, the GitHub repo includes some demo scripts where you can make other plots and shows you how to make the standard plots. So here's an example of a correlation plot for a float that has two different oxygen sensors. And you can do this for other, you could compare oxygen and temperature, of course, or any other combination of variables. So it takes a few lines of code to make this kind of plot, but it's easy. Okay, now some new features in Toolbox. As you noticed from the name, it's no longer restricted to biogeochemical argo floats alone. It is full argo now. Along with it came a new search criterion and the select profiles function. You can specify the type as either BGC or FIS or all, which is the default. If you specify a biogeochemical sensor like oxygen or nitrate, it will of course automatically only look for BGC floats. There is no special designation for deep floats on Argos, so you would specify a depth like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 decibar to find only deep floats. And note that some deep floats have an oxygen sensor and they will be classified as BGC floats. Another new feature is a new standard plot, which is maps at selected depths for selected variables. This is again is the trajectory plot for all the 96 floats that we found. And here I show how to plot the oxygen data at 20 decibars and 800 decibars for all of these floats. So you can see nicely, I use the same color uh, axis and bar for both. So you can see nicely the oxygen minimum zone at depth on the right. And note that this is only showing exactly where the profiles are. There's no gridding, no interpolation at all. Another new feature is higher efficiency. This is a bit of a technical detail and it is behind the scenes, but you will appreciate it. This is the standard workflow that I showed before. Define search criteria, explore the data, load the data at the end, and then data analysis outside of the toolbox. With a new method, you can swap the middle steps. 
So once you have your search criteria, maybe it is something that you do operational, you always use the same criteria, then it will be much faster to load the data first into memory and then pass the data structure into the profile or time series or any of the other plot routines instead of having those routines load the data every single time. For all the plots that I showed here that showed all 96 profiles, so there were two trajectory plots, one profile plot and one map plot. The first method, the original method, takes nine and a half minutes. The new method takes three and a quarter, so almost a factor three speed up. And this is a feature that I don't have yet. The R version actually has that already. When you load the data, you get a two level data structure. The first level is the float. The second level is the variable ID. So that looks like this. In the R world and Python world, people prefer the data, um, data frames. And MATLAB has recently in, introduced the table feature, which is the basically the same data structure as a data frame in Python or R. And it will look roughly like this, one flat table with all the data. And you can see there's not the float ID is not here. So this is a very crude prototype, but if there was community interest in this, I could make this available. So I would like to thank all the computer contributors who contributed to early versions of the MATLAB and R version of the toolbox. And you notice that I haven't talked about Python at all yet. For the Go BGC workshop two years ago, two grad students at UW wrote a notebook version of this toolbox that has some of its functionality, but not the full functionality. And it has been dormant since then. That is mostly because we don't have time to work on it. And there's the AlgoPy effort, which is currently under development for BGC floats. However, if you're interested in the Python, if you can't wait that long for the AlgoPy with BGC, one of our current summer interns is working on the Python toolbox and we will have some new features. So if there's interest in that, we could publish that. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Hartmut. Um, great. Uh, so there's one question. Uh, well, there's several questions. First question is from Tanya. Uh, thanks, Reiner. Is there any specific functionality in the downloadable software that is not available through the WebODV interface? Um, in, in principle, the um, WebODV um, goes pretty far, uh, but there are features in the standalone uh, desktop uh, ODV that are not yet in, in the web ODV, for instance, making animations. Um, but I, I would say uh, pretty much uh, what an ordinary uh, user would do every day um, is available on the web. And as I said before, um, the, the server-based solution um, is, is much easier on the user. No download or no hassling uh, with the data. All this is prepared. Um, no installation of any software. Um, so I would consider the server solution is, is much friendlier uh, to a user. What I what I didn't have time, um, so you, if you allow, um, then I can talk about our update strategy because everyone knows uh, that Argo, uh, the data set, is a dynamic thing. That every day, um, yeah, hundreds maybe of profiles uh, are added and and other profiles get adjusted and changed. So um, we are aware of this. While the initial setup was a manual process and it was quite time consuming, downloading almost 300,000 uh, NetCDF files. Um, we think we can set up a, a fully automatic update service. And um, we are shooting for having daily updates. And let's see whether we can do it or not. But 
we think it's it's feasible. Um, we we just have to make a stable and reliable uh, update um, yeah process. But but this is what we are aiming for. Great, thank you. Um, Armin, I had a, oh yeah, so uh, I want to highlight, there's a lot of links uh, posted by John, uh, so to the GitHub repositories for the uh, the toolbox, and also uh, there are some video tutorials for the toolbox that we recorded from our workshop two years ago, and then so that kind of goes through, uh, you know, step by step the code and running it and then seeing the plots, and as if you're interested in that, there are links uh, there as well. Um, so Harman, I had a question. So for these one Argo toolbox, it's it's designed to go to the GDAC, but is there any, you know, so now you can swap to put it in memory first. So is there any way this toolbox can be used to analyze like a, a downloaded the SPROF, you know, snapshot, for example, you know, so if you're looking at it uh, for like a publication, you know, so it's a frozen data set rather than the dynamic GDAC. Um, can you comment on that, please? I have not implemented that, but that is certainly on the to-do list, yes. Great, thank you. Um, another question by Josh Plans. Uh, what is the advantage of a MATLAB table over a matrix? Is there a lot of computational overhead with the table and large data sets? So I guess you've never used Pandas, Josh. Uh, people who work with that, they really like it. It, it's the matrix plus the column labels. So I don't think there's much overhead, no. But, you know, we the, currently the data are not in a matrix, they're in this two level struct. So it's just a very different format. Yeah. yeah and having, and there has been some uh, comments in the chat, Hartman, uh, for kind of supporting the idea of making this table functionality available. Um, I have my own kind of you know, secondary function that merges those. But if that's available for the toolbox, I think that, you know, going from the step three to step four, you know, to visualizations analysis would become um, very straightforward. And I think that would be a great um, resource for the community. Um, that is all the questions that I see in the chat. Um, I guess I'll wait 10, 15 more seconds for anyone else to put questions in the chat. And if not, um, I would very much, you know, I'd like to thank both Harmon and Reiner for their time and giving these wonderful presentations. I think, you know, both, you know, the work that you both have put in has been extremely, you know, helpful for the community and really, you know, not, yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been, yeah, it's been extremely helpful. So we really appreciate it. Um, well, I guess there are no additional questions, so um, I guess everyone gets five minutes back in their day. So thank you very much for joining this webinar, and uh, we don't have a date set for the next one or a topic yet, but hopefully we will announce that through the OCB uh, newsletter in the next month or two. So um, keep, uh, we'll keep you posted. Um, thank you for, thank you for joining. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.